want to learn how to manage your own investments? Are you ready to stop paying investment management fees and start building wealth? The DIY Investing Podcast is dedicated to providing you with the knowledge, skills, and resources you need to be a better investor. Learn how to make investments through the use of fundamental analysis, mental models, and business management insights. Now, here's your host, value investing expert, Trey Henninger. Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing Podcast. My name is Trey Henniger and I'm your host. This week I have a special guest on the show, Tobias Carlisle. Tobias is an author of four investing books, The Acquires Multiple, Quantitative Value, Deep Value, and Concentrated Investing. He is also the Chief Investment Officer at Acquires Funds LLC where he manages the ETF ZIG. Tobias, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for the great introduction, Trey. So, I recently read your book, The Acquirer's Multiple, and I really wanted to dive in and discuss this book. And so I was wondering if you could just begin with kind of a brief introduction of what you consider kind of the core concepts you were trying to communicate with The Acquirer's Multiple book. The book is about deep value investing. So just to contrast that with uh, other types of value. So Buffett, Warren Buffett, practices uh, franchise style or sort of uh, compound of value where the idea is that you're trying to find companies that grow at a very high rate uh, or or have very high returns on invested capital, sustainable returns on invested capital. And they're probably recognizable brands for the most part. And he's trying to buy that at a, at a discount to uh, what he calculates the, the intrinsic value to be, and he describes the, those companies as wonderful companies that he can buy at fair prices. So I practice uh, something a little bit different. It's called deep value. And the idea is that uh, you may not be getting a lot of growth from these businesses. They, they may be businesses that are going through a difficult period. They might be cyclical. And um, they're available, though, at very discounted prices. So to contrast Buffett's wonderful companies at fair prices, they're fair companies available at wonderful prices. Anybody who's read any Buffett will know that he prefers wonderful companies at fair prices to fair companies at wonderful prices. So why do I practice this deep value style? Um, there's a great book, The Little Book That Beats the Market, written by Joel Greenblatt, where he takes this simple quantitative version of Buffett's strategy. So he says a wonderful company is a company that has a very high return on invested capital and a fair price is a low price by enterprise value to EBIT um, and he calls that the earnings yield. He ranks every stock in the universe on both of those metrics. Then he sums together their combined, sums together their rankings to get a combined ranking and tries to buy the best 30 of those and that's the process that he describes in that book and he finds that that outperforms the market. Uh, over the period of time that he looked at, which was about 12 years or 14 years from sort of 1994, I think, to 2006, something like that. Um, we tested that again in quantitative value using – we tested that to the academic gold standard, which means you, um, you, you lag the data. So, you use a point-in-time database, which means that uh, there's no um, – there are no – any position that – any company that failed stays in the database. So, your your back test can still buy that company. And if it buys it and it fails, then, then it reduces your returns. We also then lag the data, which means we assume that you can't trade until June on the K data, which is the year-end data. So that means that all of that information should have been disseminated to the market. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not look-ahead bias, or it's not trading on information that the market didn't have. And then we market capitalization weight the companies, which doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not the way you would construct a portfolio, but we do it that way because that's how market indices are constructed to make it comparable to an index. So we find that we found in that book that uh, the magic formula, which is Joel Greenblatt's formula, does in fact beat the market, and it's got better risk-adjusted returns. So that's so that's a good thing. Um, what we found, though, just to complicate it a little bit, is that the return driver of the magic formula is all the value side of it. So that's the EBIT on enterprise value, what I call the acquirer's multiple. 
and the return on invested capital portion of it actually reduces returns. So just getting rid of that wonderful company, high return on invested capital uh, requirement improves your returns on both a raw and risk adjusted basis. So that's uh, volatility adjusted. So that's basically the thesis. It's just the, the mechanics of why that is the case. And I say that it's uh, mean reversion in the underlying business. Managers don't just sit there and let themselves, let the business fail. They sort of try to do things. Uh, activists come in, private equity firms come in. These all push up the prices of um, companies and industries that are suffering. And so if you invest buying these sort of businesses, you should be able to expect over the long run and on average, um, pretty good returns that beat both the market and magic formula style businesses. So that's the thesis in the book. So deep value then as a strategy, how would you define your target audience, either of the book or the strategy itself? You know, is this all investors, just professional investors? Is it individual and professional investors? You know, kind of what's your target audience for this strategy? The book is written to a fifth grade reading level and it's uh, you can read it in about two hours and it's full of charts. And so the idea is that anybody can read this book. The um, no, It's not necessarily going to appeal to everybody. Buffett has this great line where he says value investing is like an inoculation. It either takes or it doesn't. So for many people, they don't like the idea of buying bad businesses because you have to have some faith that the underlying business is going to turn around. Um, some people like the Buffett style more because you, you're finding businesses that are doing very well and then you're trying to buy them at a, at a discount to their fair value. So it's, it's really for anybody who, um, who, who that style of investment appeals to. So they tend to be, you know, it's a contrarian style investment strategy because you, you'll look at the data, you might look at a series of annual reports from a company and they might indicate that the company is lo is losing money or earning less money year after year. And you have to believe at some stage that this mean reversion is going to kick in. So um, I wrote it very simply so anybody can read it really, but it does tend to be a, a particular personality type that, that, that it appeals to. It's not uh, necessarily professional or amateur. That's not the distinction. It's just some personality types don't like it and others love it. That's that's what I've found. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason I asked that question is that, you know, as I read the book, one of the key components that you've discussed in terms of what makes certain implementers of deep value work, you know, because you spend time talking about uh, Buffett, Icon, Ihorn, um, different managers who have used deep value to great success. And I think one of the components that they use is this concept of control situations. And what I struggled with as an investor managing smaller sums of money is although the strategy is clearly backed up and you give a lot of data around that, it's like, well, am I going to be able to implement that strategy to the same degree because I don't have the ability to take control of a company um, with a lot of excess capital sitting aside. So are, are individuals at a disadvantage implementing this strategy or should that component just be something left to professionals and then you can still implement other parts? Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, I use those examples to show that in many instances, the, uh, you know, the deus ex machina, there'll be some, one of the potential ways that you can, see these businesses succeed is through the intervention or the intercession of an activist or a private equity firm or an investor like Icahn or, or Einhorn. And that's happened you know, many times in my investing career. I've bought a position in a company without an activist. And that's when it looks the absolute worst. It looks like management's going to keep on running this thing into the ground. And then the, the, the activist appears and has many of the same complaints that you know, I would have as a, as an investor who's not big enough to influence these companies myself, and then they turn the companies around. And so, you know, a great example of that, which I talked about in real time on Twitter, uh, and it's happened several times, and I detail it in the book, is Apple. In 2013, 
Apple was one of the cheapest companies in my large cap screen. And I bought it and held it. And then uh, famously, Icon and Einhorn both bought positions in it and lobbied to have them return some capital, which they did through a buyback. And then the company, of course, went on to have this great run thereafter. And it happened again in 2016. The company got very cheap. I tweeted about it again uh, after buying some. And uh, the, the, the company ran away again. So that's happened more recently again. I, I, I own some Hewlett Packard uh, in the fund. And ICANN is now lobbying to have them merge with Xerox. So it's something that um, it happens regularly. That and this is part of the reason that I that I invest in the in the market that I do. So I focus on mid cap. So mid cap's about a billion, up to say ten or fifteen billion, somewhere in that vicinity, because that's that's policed or trafficked by. Uh, by activist firms and professional private equity. And I think that those businesses are also, also sort of big enough that they can survive little downturns in the market and they've got professional managers. So that's a good part of the market to be in because if you're investing in there, you'll find that anything that gets really cheap is pursued pretty quickly by by one of these professional firms. And so that's, that's, a, that's one mechanism um, for generating better returns, for the most part, it's just going to be mean reversion in the underlying business, which you don't need to be a professional investor or a big investor to take advantage of. That makes sense. I think the Apple example really resonated with me because although I didn't follow you at that time, I invested in Apple in 2013 and I invested in Apple in 2016, both times before um, the activists started getting involved. And it was um, Buffett in 2016. Yeah, Buffett was in 2016, but both times I had gotten in just before um, those things became public. Um, and and a, certainly in 2013, it was interesting how that performance worked out and the activists, I, you know, it wasn't part of my strategy for those activists to be there. It's like, oh, this company's cheap and affordable. But um, of course, it worked out really well when they came in and, and did it. But I guess that was... So the, it's you're kind of shopping in an area where you expect activists to be so you're to, to be right. paying attention as well so then you don't have to be that activist yourself is that exactly right exactly right and i would never i just don't have the personality for it so i would never find myself in an act well unlikely that i would find myself in an activist situation other than sort of defensively but i i like the fact that they are there because it stops these management from you know running it like it's their own private domain and they have they, do, they are answerable to the shareholders and uh, there are shareholders who will enforce shareholder rights in that area. So I, I think it's a great part of the market to be in. And, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I think that protects some of your downside. Yeah. So, I mean, it certainly protects your downsides when the activists get involved, but do you still have protection against potential you know the potential for a sale of the stock at a low price so if you're hitting like a 2008 2009 the market's crashed and you're buying in could you get trapped with you know someone tries to come buy the whole company at a price that's well below what you think that value is then uh, because you don't have the resources to file a 13d and be a five percent shareholder or is that just part of you know what diversification's for or something yeah so that you know that of course that's going that that could potentially happen at any point in the market it doesn't have to be a 2007 8 9 type scenario but you know the the thing that i would point to is that i have pretty extensive back tests in there that show how this strategy would have performed over very long periods of time and it has been one of the better performed strategies out there so part of the book is just describing why that is. And a lot of it is people are just afraid of buying these companies because the business looks so bad. And so you have to you have to do some analysis to make sure that the the business can survive. It needs to be, you know, either a robust balance sheet or generating some free cash flow or, or something like that. But these are um, these are businesses that ha- this is a, a method that has worked very well over an extended period of time. You know, it goes through periodic under periods of underperformance so we're going through one right now where it hasn't really worked since about january 2018 to date but that's not because the companies are being taken under it's just that the more expensive part of the market has run away which you know is not something that you is not uncommon at the at the top of a bull market so 
as a deep value investor, you spend a lot of time talking in the book about how the strategy beats the market. And the question I have today, especially in a time where the market is performing very well, you know, if you look at the last 10 years, the market's performed extremely well in terms of better than its history. So it's not earning 10% a year, it's it's earned something on the range of 15% a year. And right. so the question is, do you have what is your goal as a deep value investor? Are you just trying to beat the market in terms of like relative returns? Or do you perhaps also have like an absolute return that you're trying to hit? Like you it doesn't matter that I beat the market, I also want ten percent, fifteen percent, or twenty percent a year. Or would you be okay earning five percent a year if the market, you know, was losing money over a, t- a ten year period or something like that? So there's no return objective for me it's more that i like the i like to know what's in my portfolio and i like to know that the i like i I like to be comfortable with the characteristics of the companies that i own so if you think about the market what the market really is is an it is an index a market capitalization weighted index what that means is that bigger companies get more capital and Everything else being equal, bigger companies tend to be more overvalued. So if you have two businesses, one's both earning $100 million a year in net profit each, one's on 20 times earnings, that's a $2 billion company. One's on 10 times earnings, that's a $1 billion company. So in the index, the $2 billion company attracts twice as much capital as the $1 billion company. As a value investor, I would rather own the $1 billion company than the $2 billion company. So what I'm trying to do is maximize the amount of free cash flow, assets, earnings, buybacks as I possibly can on a per share basis. So I'm trying to create a portfolio that uh, has as much uh, future return embedded in it as I possibly can. And if I went, if I I would never construct a portfolio the way that the index is constructed because it just doesn't make any sense to me. The only logical approach to doing it is the way that I do it to, according to, you know, the, I, I use a particular, an unusual style, but um, the, 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 there's no return expectation in any given year. You know, your returns are always going to be dependent on the opportunity set that you find in front of you. So it, the market is extremely expensive. Value hasn't participated as much, although value has done reasonably well over the last decade too. It's just relative to the market. It hasn't done as well. So, the opportunity set is in 2019, the opportunity set is wholly different to the one that I had in 2009. And so my return expectation in 2009 was much, much higher than my return expectation now. So I can tell you in my own portfolio, my return expectation for the portfolio for the next 12 months, given the portfolio characteristics at the moment is somewhere between 10 and 15%. I think that the return expectation for the market is something in the order of 2%, including dividends. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what happens because there's a lot of noise, but that's my expectation. And, I've, and every year I'm trying to construct a portfolio that has the optimum kind of forward return uh, and whatever you get is what you get. Yeah. I mean, you can't control your returns. You can only control your process. Um, right. And so your process is driven by what you call the acquirer's multiple, which is earnings or EV divided by operating earnings. Right. So, so what's the importance of using the enterprise value instead of just the market cap like most people do with a price to price to earnings multiple? So great question. So the reason that it's called the acquirer's multiple is we're thinking like an acquirer, which means we're thinking about buying the, the company in its entirety. And what happens when you buy a business in its entirety is that you become responsible for the debt that it has. If it has any preference shares, then you're responsible for the preference shares. If it's got an underfunded pension, you have to be able to top that up. Uh, If there are convertible notes hidden in the notes, then you're responsible for those. So what we're doing when we're thinking like an acquirer is looking at all of the debt and liabilities that come attached to the business that aren't reflected in the market capitalization. The reason that's important is you can often have something that's heavily indebted that uh, it, it has a, a small market cap but a great deal of debt, which is why it looks optically cheap on a market capitalization basis. But it's not in actual fact cheap because there are all of these liabilities that the company is responsible for. So it's just a 
it's just a um, it's a holistic approach to looking at the purchase price. So I, I use that I use that terminology a lot on my page. I, I often think in holistic terms. I want to look at everything that it owes, everything that it owns, and then I want to look at the cash flow statements. Make sure it's generating lots of free cash flow. Make sure the earnings match the cash flow. Make sure that the balance sheet is healthy, and we're not overpaying because we're missing some liability that we should be taking into account. So, do you have a, a target acquires multiple? Like, I only like to buy, you know, companies below a acquires multiple of ten or five or so. I mean, is there a certain threshold you're seeking, or is it just always buy the lowest? Uh, kind of, what are you looking for in terms of an acquires multiple? Yeah, so I, you want to buy the lowest that you possibly can. But in terms of a rough rule of thumb, I think 10 times is, is a reasonable rule of thumb to be buying. And then, you know, you want to sell potentially somewhere between 15 and 20 times. But I like to buy below 10. So one aspect that you talk about then in terms of, you know, you say like 10 times acquires most, that'd be the enterprise value is 10 times the operating earnings. Is that right? The other way around. The, uh, or, yes, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. No, no, you're, you're right. No, sorry, you're right. The, you, you can think about it on a yield basis too. So you're, you're, you're paying the enterprise value, that's your cost, and you're getting back in return the operating earnings. So you want an operating earnings yield of roughly 10% or better. Okay. So you talk about um, in your book, negative enterprise value companies which right. would seem to be the the key definition of the cheapest you can get so right. so do you spend i mean these are also what 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 Ben Graham would have called net nets right they're not quite net nets but yes they it shares the same it, it's the same um it's the same philosophy you sort of you're really relying on mean reversion in the business mean reversion in the stock price relative to the underlying value. You're not relying on performance in the business. It's not a compound or it's not growing. You, you really try to get something for free. Yeah. So would you fill your port- would you be comfortable filling your portfolio then with only negative EV companies? I mean, because they would Absolutely. Cert- if I could find them, I'd yeah. fill it up. If you look at the, the long-term returns to negative enterprise value are spectacular. So- is the struggle then simply that there aren't any of them or many of them in that billion dollar to ten billion dollar range or fifteen billion, whatever you had? They're had very said. hard to find. That's that's exactly right. Because because what you think about what it that what it means to have a negative enterprise value. The only way you get a negative enterprise value is if you have more cash than all of the other liabilities and the market capitalization. So that would be a business that has a billion dollars in cash a market capitalization of 500 million and no debt that has a negative enterprise value of 500 million dollars they just don't exist because they uh it's free money and there are people trying to pick those things up all the time the real the, the time the only time that you find them really is in a big market dislocation like a 2007 2009 event yeah, I mean, I, I think that's certainly true for larger companies. So I actually spend most of my time focused on more of the micro microcap space, where they tend to be more available. So I guess the question would be: Is would you be willing to go into companies that were a lower market cap because they were a negative EV, or are you staying focused in that mid cap range for reasons that maybe the let's say the mean reversion's better or something along those lines? Yeah, so the the, the ETF has uh, liquidity, you know, restrictions oh, okay. because yeah. it's, so that, that's the reason that the ETF can't go down below that level. But, you know, in my PA and in in, uh, in other times, I've, I've hunted for negative enterprise value companies alongside hunting for net nets and uh, th- those sort of opportunities because, you know, that, f- to my mind, that is the... That is the real um, that 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 process by which those companies tend to outperform the market is the it really describes the mechanics of of value investing because what you're looking for is a big discount to a you know largely static value so they're easy to calculate and the only way that they sort of perform is by 
other investors paying more than you did for that position. Sometimes you get some min reversion in the underlying business. Sometimes they recover. But for the most part, all you're doing is buying at a discount to a static value that somehow over the course of the year through mean reversion between the price and the value that gap closes and that is probably one of the best performed strategies out there it's just that they're very hard to find they're, they're available in micro caps they're available internationally there's a lot in japan yeah they're just they're just hard to find and hard to invest in so so but all i'm trying to get to is that for other investors i have a lot of individual investors in the audience in my podcast you'd recommend that strategy of say if you have if you could find a portfolio of 20 net nets or 20 negative ev stocks that would be a good portfolio because maybe they have a different opportunity set than you that's a great portfolio yeah. you have to understand what you're buying and why you're doing it but that is a great portfolio because you you have to realize that the businesses are going to be terrible businesses but if you if you can find that if you can find them i think they're they're great opportunities on yeah, the, average over time well they're terrible businesses but the concept that I gleaned from your deep value strategy is that you're you're spending less time on how good the business might be and more time on just buying the cheapest stuff. Is that right? Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. So one question I had, when I was reading through your book, you had this statement on operating earnings where if two businesses have the same operating earnings, they should theoretically be worth the same amount, even if they have in terms of enterprise value, even if they have a different mix of debt and equity. And I was just hoping you could explain that to me because when I was thinking about it, it wasn't intuitive that, you know, let's say your enterprise value is a billion dollars for both companies and they're both earning a hundred million dollars in operating earnings. Why should those companies have identical enterprise values if one is all equity and the other one's 50 equity and 50% equity and 50% debt? Because it seems to me that it's, worth more if the company can hold debt to an equity investor. Does that make sense? Why, why is it worth more? Because if the company is able to support debt due to reliability of earnings or something, then they could potentially pay out higher dividends or something along those lines. That's my thinking. Now, I, I, I'm open to being wrong. It was more just, it seemed counterintuitive Um that idea you you just need to i you know i'm saying that there are two businesses that are identical they're growing at the same rate they have the same level of earnings for all intents and purposes they're identical businesses just one and they both have the same enterprise value of say a billion dollars relative to a hundred million dollars in earnings if one has 500 million dollars in debt the market capitalization because we know what the enterprise value is it's a billion dollars the market capitalization must be 500 million dollars Gotcha. And the other one has no debt, the market capitalization will be a billion dollars. You shouldn't assume that the one that is a billion dollars in market cap is twice as valuable or is twice the price of the one that is five hundred million. They're identical prices because they have one has a one has debt, you know, which is just that's a decision that management makes. You could you could take that company private, you could make it nine hundred million dollars in debt, one hundred million dollars in equity you can take it public again and you can replace that debt with all equity like these are just decisions that the owners the managers make about the business and it shouldn't impact your evaluation of it as an investor you know of course having debt in there then makes the the company slightly riskier there are other things to consider i'm I'm simplifying it for the purposes of demonstrating just that you need to be aware of the debt on the balance sheet oh okay no that that makes sense to me so i guess it's the idea that because the CEO or the CFO has decided this is the balance, it's also something they could change their mind on tomorrow. So you need to judge the business in terms of what the EV you want to pay, right? regardless of it, because they could change their mind, basically. You just need to be aware of the debt, Okay, is what I'm saying. So if you find something that's trading at $500 million, it's not necessarily half the price of the thing that's trading at a billion dollars. You don't know yeah. what the situation is until you include the debt. Okay. So 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 but you so you would take it you would still take that difference into account when you're building your portfolio with your ETF though. You're going to say okay, how are yes. these companies different? The thing is that I that that it it's never it would never become an issue in the portfolio because I'm always looking for the highest ratio of 
operating earnings to what I'm paying, which is enterprise value. So oh, okay. the things that are um, marginal are so far out of the, 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 the universe or the screen that I'm actually looking at. The things that I'm looking at are going to be incredibly cheap on both. So, uh, you know, they're, it's a, they're going to have a low enterprise value relative to very robust operating earnings. And so the question is always for mine, why is this mispriced? Yeah. What's the issue with this company? Okay. So in terms of the strategy, it seems like the entire strategy depends on mean reversion. So if we were to use Charlie Munger's idea of inversion, the whole weak link then is mean reversion. So the question I have for you is, you know, what could cause mean reversion to fail or stop working permanently? And how can you be confident that mean reversion isn't simply you know, perhaps an artifact of the most recent 150 years of history and that maybe some other set of market circumstances could cause mean reversion to stop. Let's invert it and think about it from the other perspective. What makes it work? So that was a question that was posed to Graham when he was uh, appearing before a, a subcommittee following the 1929 bust. And they said, how do you, once you get one of these positions, how, do, how does it come about that the market recognizes that it's undervalued? Graham said at that time, it's one of the great mysteries of the business. So he was being a little bit coy because the real uh, answer is it's microeconomics. When something gets undervalued, so you identified Apple as being undervalued in 2013. I, I identified it as being undervalued. We both bought it. And that mechanism, fundamental investors, value investors, buying something that's undervalued creates the flaw in these things. And as more and more people buy the company, and then the next person pays a marginally higher price than the last person. That is how mean reversion comes about. So for mean reversion to go away, it would mean that fundamental value invest fundamental investors and value investors were no longer doing what they were doing. So I think that mean reversion is going to persist. It's sort of it, I think it's almost like an iron law of nature. And I don't know what circumstances would arise for it to go away. It would have to be the stock exchange shutting down or uh, you know, full-blown communism or something like that. I think that uh, mean reversion is one of the things that you really can rely on. So in terms of, you, you mentioned the stock market shutting down. So this is definitely an area where your strategy would differ significantly from Warren Buffett's current strategy, not his old strategy of being a deep value investor, where he says you should buy stocks that if the market shut down for 10 years, you'd be happy to own them. That is not the strategy we're implementing here. No, I, I'd be I'd be happy to buy these companies and hold them for ten years. It's just that, you know, if you do a back test on the Russian stock market prior to uh, the communists coming to power, the back test doesn't look really good because there's a point where everything goes to zero. That's true of any country where there's been a complete oh, okay. revolution. The back tests aren't going to look great. You know, we have. The U.S. has a great long-term track record because the U.S. stock market has existed. You know, the first part of that is that the U.S. stock market has existed continuously through that entire period. I'm more than happy for, you know, you think about what, what you're buying. I'm buying, I'm buying an oil company right now that I think is incredibly undervalued. You know, do I care whether the stock market's open so I can trade it? No, I, I'm I'm relying on mean reversion in the underlying business and in the discount to the cash flow, uh, the discount to the intrinsic value closing. But you would agree that your returns could be higher if that mean reversion occurred quicker. Sure. Right. So I mean that I mean that would be the benefit of having the market open and having relative you know that market constantly available is maybe it mean reverts in a year versus five years or ten years which is what tends to happen the, the you know i would I, I i'm not relying on mean reversion to generate the returns i'm i'm, I'm sorry i'm not re relying on mean reversion in the stock price to generate returns i'm relying on mean reversion in the underlying business to generate returns but in most instances there's mean reversion in the stock price as well and that occurs faster than the mean reversion in the business. Because as soon as the business turns around, the stock price sprints ahead. So like it, you're, so to capture that, what you just said, you're saying, okay, if the business turns around, so instead of dropping earnings 30%, earnings rose 10% this year. Right. So you're going to capture that 10% growth from the earnings rise, but you might also capture an additional 
forty percent from the stock price rising. Right. Okay. Not in those exact figures. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to. I'm getting, but yes, that's the idea. Just to, just to get a sense of it. Um, and I draw in the, in the, the acquirers multiple in the book. There are these charts at the front, um, that are, uh, you know, just representative of what I think occurs in the business. So I try to show that there's a cycle in the business. But then the cycle in the stock price far overshoots the cycle in the business. So there's, you know, we, we, it wasn't that long ago that oil and gas companies were very, very popular and they were trading at prices that suggested that they weren't cyclicals and that they were going to continue to grow at the rate that they had. Anybody who's been an investor for a, one cycle knows that oil and gas price or oil and gas companies are cyclical and you don't want to be paying a peak price on a peak a peak multiple on peak earnings for an oil and gas company and now we're in the reverse situation where their their trough earnings and a trough multiple so i think oil and gas is pretty cheap right now but i know that um the earnings will get better a little bit in the future the stock price will go up probably more than is warranted at which point i'm a vendor yeah so when we think about how this strategy is working and the idea that this strategy beats the market over time or it beats, let's say, um, investing in wonderful companies at fair prices. So let's talk, let's compare deep value to Buffett's strategy here for a second. And what I've thought about is what I'm going to call the back test problem. And, sure. and what this would be is, is that the back press back test makes some assumptions, which can affect one strategy differently than the other. So in terms of your assumptions, when I, you know, reading the appendix says that you're rebalancing monthly um, of this 30 stock portfolio that's equally weighted. But when you think about how like a practitioner of Buffett's strategy actually invests, it tends to be a lot more concentrated with very little rebalancing. So do you think that that could have impacted the um, nature of that result of that it might beat that strategy because it doesn't necessarily beat, let's say, the returns that Buffett actually received. Now, he's considered the best investor in the world by some, so it's maybe not a fair comparison, but I wanted to pose the question. Yeah, so we tested in quantitative value. We used a different rebalancing methodology where we we – rebalanced on an annual basis okay. and that r yielded the same results it's not so much a question of how often it's rebalanced i think that the um the question that i often get from buffett style guys is well what if we take the rebalancing out to five years does that then improve the returns and it doesn't that i i back tests are imperfect and they're um you know they could be improved in any number of ways every time i run one i get Every time I write a book, I get literally hundreds of folks suggesting some variation. Sure. You now we t we test all of those variations in the preparation for the book because we're trying to find a representative way of showing what what we've discovered. It doesn't really change much. If you run a back test, assuming five years of rebalancing, and then you can do that on a rolling basis. You know, so you're rebalancing. You know, so that's 60 opportunities to rebalance if you're rebalancing on a monthly basis. So you rebalance one sixtieth of the portfolio and then you hold that one sixtieth for five years and you don't rebalance until the end. You still get the bulk of the return coming in the first 12 months because that's the point where the undervaluation is the most stretched. And the bigger the undervaluation, the better the returns, everything else being equal. Okay, so it's less about those individual assumptions and more just you're really having the turn return then driven by that mean reversion. It's what you talk about, but it's, you know, if it's occurring quickly, then it's becoming, it's the mean reversion of the business and the price that's giving you that return and less, let's say a compounded return. Yeah. So the, the compounded return. So uh, for, for, long-term investors who hold businesses over extended periods of time, and I forget the exact proportions, but you know, over two, five, 10 years, your long-term return becomes your return, the, the sustained return on invested capital over the period that you hold it. So uh, for a long-term investor who's looking to hold for extremely long periods of time, they should focus on sustainable return on invested capital because the higher that number is, the better their returns will be. 
The problem is that there are very few companies that can sustain high returns on invested capital. Most companies, 96% of companies, will mean revert over that decade to basically the mean. So the challenge and what Buffett's great genius has been has been to identify these companies that do have these moats that have a competitive advantage that resist mean reversion. It's about 4% of companies. Michael Mobison has done, I think, the best work in identifying them. And even Mobison will say that they're, they're hard to identify um, prospectively. They're easy to identify after the fact, but you don't get paid for identifying them after the fact. You only get paid for identifying them beforehand. Sure. So I guess that underlying assumption then st- tends to be that it's – the, identif- the skill of identifying the companies that are durably profitable is rare. So do you think that's a skill that's teachable or is it just ingrained in certain investors? So I would take, you know, so Mobison is the one who's done the sort of scientific replicable approach to it. Otherwise, you know, what I'm saying is that there's probably a lot of luck in it. Okay. Because you don't, you, you know, you and I can identify what we think are the ones that will be sustainably growing over the next decade. And one of us will be more right than the other, but does that mean that one of us is one of us has done a better job at identifying? Was one of us got lucky? It's very hard to tease out the difference between skill and luck in something like that. If you focus on them and you buy lots of them, it's likely that you're going to find some that do materially outperform over a very long period of time. I think a more sustainable, higher hit rate way of doing it is just to identify things that are very undervalued. That's not to say that the other style doesn't work. I just think it's harder to do. Okay. So you think it's harder and Buffett's going to be more the exception than the than the norm. Well, when you look at what Buffett's returns have been since he's been identified as being a great investor and he's got other problems like having lots of money to invest, having too much money to invest, his returns haven't been that great. All of the best returns that he got were when he was a deep value practitioner looking for net nets and then very undervalued companies moving like an activist or a, a liquidator in some instances. And since he's been, uh, you know, it's either through the weight of having too much money to invest or his transition to this uh, franchise compounder style, the returns haven't been as good, even though they've been very good. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. So I guess it leads me into um, Potentially a challenging question, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. So if if the business analysis doesn't matter in terms of helping you dif- differentiate between you know, which companies have more moats and you shouldn't focus on like the moat of a business, then it seems like you can really quantify and break down this strategy into very simple rules and formulaic analysis. So if that's true, then what what value does the portfolio manager provide over, say, a computer? Could a computer implement a deep value strategy and have an ETF that charges five basis points? Um, and, and how does the portfolio manager in 2019 and beyond provide that extra value? It's conceivable that a computer could do that because, you know, to invert the question again, how are you making these assessments of the quality of management or of the business absent from the financial statements? Because the way that I think about it, if you're doing that, you're double counting, right? You're looking outside the finan- what's reflected in the financial statements to find something that uh, – what management's telling you or your own, your own views on the industry. So I think that, uh, yeah, it's conceivable that a uh, computer could do it. The issue for any uh, investor, though, is not – it's – All of this stuff is simple. The Buffett stuff is pretty simple. None of it is particularly hard to do. The problem is not one of intellect. The problem is one of emotion and behavior. You have to be able to underperform. You have to be able to hold positions that don't do as well as the rest of the market with sort of equanimity because you understand the underlying logic of what you're doing and you think that that's a better way of approaching the problem than than the other options that are out there. So I think that uh, there's nothing particularly complex about what any of us do. You just have to be um, behaviorally suited to having long periods of underperformance, some negative performance. This is tracking error, as it's called. And you have to be able to um, articulate why the strategy can outperform in the future 
even though it's not performing now. And you have to be able to articulate it to yourself. And that's, that's a challenge. So in terms of this temperament you're talking about, is this something that you think investors can teach themselves to control their emotions in that way? Or is it something that you really need to know? Buffett's philosophy is that he thinks that you're either born with it or you're not. Yeah, I don't. I think you can learn it. I def, I would certainly not say that I had it initially. I think that I've developed it. And I think that the way that you develop it is that you don't focus on the stock price. You focus on the underlying value of the company. And that doesn't change that often. That changes at most on a quarterly basis. So if you do a valuation, you watch the valuation. You need two data points to work out whether your valuation is going in the right direction. So you need one quarter and then you need the following quarter. So your minimum uh, holding period is three months or maybe a little bit longer than that. And, uh, you know, you really only need to check twice in that period of time to see how your assessment is going. So I think that, you know, Taleb has this great line in, uh, in Fooled by Randomness where he says that it's not, you know, it's not moralizing or uh, trying to hammer in this sort of you know, chiding yourself for behaving badly because you're just going to fail. You have a finite amount of willpower, self-control, and it's a depleting asset. What you have to do is just find some way of tricking yourself into doing the right thing. So that's what I do. I just trick myself into doing the right thing. I focus on the underlying value and I rebalance the portfolio on a quarterly basis and I have rules around how I do that. So there's no, it's not temperament on my behalf because temperament can fail. You know, human beings are fallible but the process is so fixed and ingrained and public that there's just no way that i can do anything but follow the process so then as a professional investor is the hardest part managing your emotions or the emotions of your investors yeah part of it is making sure that you attract investors who who view investment the same way so i'm I've been writing publicly for a little bit over a decade and I think that, you know, you know what you're going to get from me. It's going to be a particular deep value style and um, the process is all public. The holdings are transparent. You can replicate my portfolio and not pay me a fee if you'd like to do that. So I I don't think it's really either because I I have a process that I have to go through and I, and the investors are going to get that process. You know, you come to this restaurant, we serve a particular type of food. If you want a different type of food, you have to go to a different restaurant. The restaurant's not going to change the food that it serves. So we advertise a particular type of food and we serve that every single night. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That, now, that's a good explanation. So my last question for you then is, in particular in your backtesting testing you talk about excluding non you exclude financial companies. And so I'm just wondering how you apply the acquirers multiple to financial companies because I noticed in your current top 10 holdings, you own some financial co- companies. Right. Uh, you know, as an investor, I like holding uh, insurance companies and I like banks. And they're not as amenable to an acquirer's multiple valuation as other industrial type companies are. So there has to be some change to the process to do that. You know, the traditional way of valuing insurance companies and banks has been a book value valuation. So that's what we do. And then we have to make it um, an apples to apples uh, comparison to the acquirer's multiple. So that's some of the work that we have done to get that uh, to get that to, to to marry up. Um, that's not something I've sort of discussed publicly a great deal because I think it's some of the it's a little bit of the magic that we're trying to put into <laughs> yeah. the portfolio. But that's that's something that we do. And the traditional way of valuing those things is book value. But I think that you can you can have a a marriage between both of them that r- results in that, that generates pretty good results. Well, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. If you'd like take a minute to promote your um, fund or anything else, how you'd like people to follow you, how you'd like people to reach out if they would like to reach out to you. Sure thing. So I'm on Twitter all day long on uh, my handle is Greenbacked, which is G-R-E-E-N-B-A-C-K-D. And I have a website, acquirersmultiple.com. 
And uh, the the firm is acquirers funds plural dot com, and the the ETF is the acquirers fund. The ticker is ZIG, and you can see the holdings and the performance and so on on the website acquirersfund dot com. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Really enjoyed hey, it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Those were great questions, Trey. Thank you for listening to the DIY Investing Podcast. Please visit our website and subscribe to our email list at DIYinvesting.org for guides, videos, and resources to help make you a better investor. The DIY Investing Podcast is presented for general informational and entertainment purposes only. I have not considered your specific situation or risk profile, and I have not provided investment advice. The information presented on the DIY Investing Podcast should not be construed as investment advice. The views and opinions expressed on the DIY Investing Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's host or sponsors. DIY Investing, its producers, sponsors, and host, Trey Hinegar, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based upon information or viewpoints presented on the DIY Investing Podcast.